Yes, what's coming up on the program? Egypt raises monthly minimum wage again for private sector workers. And Zimbabwe donates maize to World Food Program. Stock futures in the U.S. kick up holiday shortened week of trading lower. Thanks for joining us on Business Incorporated. I'm Will Ebong. Let's check in. On the markets, as we do, as always, we kick off with Africa, where major equities were trading with mostly negative sentiments at intraday. We see the Nigerian index up 0.1%, but South Africa, however, was down in the red at intraday. Now, look at Egypt. We see the EGX30 was also down massively by 0.35% at intraday, while Kenya closed Friday's trading session very bullish. Now, let's take a look at the Middle East and see how trading was at intraday. Market stocks were mostly negative at intraday. Abu Dhabi, however, was up 0.11%. We see Dubai down more than a third of a percent. Elsewhere, Saudi was marginally down 0.08%, followed by Qatar index, which was down as well, 0.15%. Now to the EU, where the Chinese Premier Li Chang is in Berlin as part of a two-nation visit of Germany and France. It is the Chinese Premier's first international trip since taking office in March this year. China is Germany's number one trading partner, but recently some European countries have expressed mistrust and may want to distance themselves from Beijing. For more on this, we are joined by Deutsche Welle's Warda Imran. Warda, what is the significance of this trip and its timing? Thanks for having me. The trip is significant because it is the Chinese Premier's first international one. However, it comes at a time when there is mistrust about China and its role in the global economy looming in Europe. The EU and Germany look at China as a partner for communication, negotiation, but also as a systemic rival and an economic competitor. That's a lot of labeling. I think this, coupled with policy and legislation aimed at curbing the presence of Chinese pre businesses in Europe, has gotten Beijing worried. For example, the EU proposed a ban on Chinese telecom giant Huawei on the EU's 5G networks. So I think that Li Qiang is on this tour to kind of secure the confidence of businesses here. Ultimately, I think that's what China cares about a lot, its dealings and contracts with German companies. When Premier Qiang landed yesterday, he was hosted by the German president, had dinner with the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, but some analysts commented that Berlin's welcome wasn't as big as it usually is when Germany is trying to expand business in China. This time, Germany can boast of more diverse trading partners. Also, in the national security strategy of Berlin, Beijing was sort of accused of acting against German interests, but Berlin is firm on the fact that Beijing's cooperation in global issues and crisis is imperative. But on the Chinese Premier's agenda is talks with government and business officials. Tell us about that. Yes, the Chinese Premier and his team of leaders and ministers want to engage with both the government and, importantly, the businesses here. The government consultations began already with trade, climate change and the Ukraine war on the agenda. I think the Chinese leader chose Germany because while the current government is tougher on China than Angela Merkel's previous government, Berlin is still one of the more pragmatic countries on the China risk assessment. And Berlin is quite willing to continue this relationship. But it will raise some tough questions about the Ukraine war, human rights abuses in China and other issues that might make the delegation uncomfortable. This morning, the German economy minister met with the head of China's mm. top economic regulator. Some observers here in Germany are of the opinion that this trip may try to influence Berlin's China strategy, which is to be unveiled soon. Mm. Yeah, those are tough questions to be asked there. But what about China's communication and messaging towards German businesses? 
Well, over the last five years or longer, the two countries have grown closer because of their economic cooperation, a large part because of German businesses that have strong presence there. Mercedes, BMW, Siemens, Volkswagen, BASF, these big German names are all very closely watching, observing on how this trip unfolds. Yesterday, the Chinese Premier met some representatives of these companies. He's set to meet more high-level ones today. But the messaging that I think Beijing is trying to send on this trip is that all the threats and risks Germany talks about, businesses should handle it. So the de-risking that the US and many EU countries point to, those should come from businesses, not governments. I think that's what China will try to convey to the companies and enterprises that they meet here. Minimizing risk and assessing how acute these risks should be handled by enterprises. That's what Premier Chiang thinks. And I think investors, market players, and everyone will be watching closely. Well, we'll definitely be watching, Warda. Thank you so much for those updates. Now we go over to West Africa, where the introduction of the Pan-African Payment Settlement System is helping the continent save over $5 billion, making significant impact on trade. The president of the Afrexim Bank, Ben Orama, said this in his opening remark at the 30th anniversary edition of the annual meeting, where he also added that in the last 30 years, the bank has demonstrated a strong financial base and commitment towards strengthening intra-African trade of the Afri Exim Bank annual meeting holding here in Accra, Ghana. And today I've seen powerhouses, heavyweights from the African continent and the Caribbean lend their voices to the need for countries to break down trade barriers and improve on trade financing. And these are two core areas where the Afri Exim Bank plays significant role. It's not a drum of war, but of shared values. A call for Africans and Caribbeans to embrace their brotherhood, bridge gaps, and set a better rhythm for trade and investment. Notable personalities with requisite experience are lined up to dig into the day's discourse. The president and chairman, board of directors of the bank, Ben Orama, highlights how for 30 years, Africa's and Bank has worked to stimulate a consistent expansion, diversification and development of African trade. It is now possible for a Gambian to buy Nigerian urea fertilizers using Gambian Dalasi to purchase Naira. And the time will come when we will, have to, we will be reducing our national debt because we will be pricing our infrastructure projects in African currencies, in our own currencies. We will be able to domesticate all intra-African payments and extend the same to the CARICOM. The keynote speaker is the president of Ghana, Nana Akufo Ato. He wants to see an Africa that is resilient and productive. Africa has to exploit a productive capabilities collectively and build the capacity of our continental development banks in order to re realize the Africa we want and an Africa beyond aid. How prepared are the government of African and Caribbean countries in advancing this call to our prosperous continents? It is the political will that first and foremost makes the difference to whether we are prepared to rise to the occasion and to overcome the challenges that hitherto have been placed before us. And I refer not now yet to the existential challenges, but to the challenges that were foisted upon us by colonialism and division. A lot of views have been exposed today, but core to the success of this event will be the implementation. And we hope that the government of the day would find these ideas as enough for implementation. From Accra, Ghana, Chris Alems, Channels Television News. 
Africa does need the political will to thrive. And uh, that was a report by our Channel's TV correspondent, Chris Elams. Now to Nigeria, where President Bola Tinubu has been receiving nods on his recent economic decisions, such as the foreign exchange rate unification and petrol subsidy removal. The latest is from the chairman of Bharti Airtel Worldwide, Mr. Sunil Bharti Mittal. After the meeting, Mr. Mittal shared some points of his conversation with the president to include conversations by international companies on their plans for operations in Africa, as well as fighting poverty. Let's take a listen. One of the biggest problems for foreign investors in this country for many, many years has been lack of easy available of foreign exchange. We as foreign investors who have spent billions of dollars here do not mind paying whatever the market rate is, the market must decide. But to be prevented from importing critical infrastructure equipment, paying uh, uh, invoices to our partners like IBM and other uh, software agencies was making it extremely difficult for companies like Airtel and I'm sure that was the case with others as well. Uh, one of the key uh, changes that uh, His Excellency the President has made in the first few days of his tenure has been making Naira free float onto the market, letting the market decide, as opposed to CBN's very convoluted structure of four or five exchange rates, which was very difficult to navigate for companies like ourselves and many, many others, MNCs. As you've all seen, the Naira has devalued, uh, but uh, the worldwide markets have given a standing ovation to this move. And uh, the dollar bonds have strengthened here in uh, Nigeria. And generally, there is an excitement in the investing and uh, uh, companies who are going to be coming uh, to put up their bases here in Nigeria. I also saw his president's deep commitment to removing poverty. I come from a country, uh, India, where we also have had decades of uh, poverty, which has been rapidly uh, minimized and eradicated in some parts through intervention of massive infrastructure investment, massive digital ecosystem creation, and using digital infrastructure to provide services by the government to its citizens, be that uh, direct benefit transfer in the form of cash in the hands of people, biometric-based uh, banking transactions, biometric-based health services. During the COVID time, India, as you know, through the biometric could uh, ensure that every citizen of the country was inoculated and vaccinated. And all these uh, things that the technology can offer and more are now fully at display in India and available to its friendly uh, countries in Africa like Nigeria. We discussed that part as well. I leave uh, uh, Abuja with great uh, excitement, uh, with a clear commitment from our side that we will make significantly more investments here roll out 5G in a very faster way, put more fiber into the ground, put more data centers, and importantly, uh, you know, support the flourishing technology startup ecosystem, which again, India has done extremely well. Mm. Now to other stories. Asia-Pacific markets traded mixed on Tuesday as investors digested China's central bank's decision to cut one-year and five-year loan prime rate by 10 basis points each to 3.55% and 4.2%. The move comes after the People's Bank of China cut some of its latest its key lending rates last week. Mainland China's markets were mixed following the announcement with the Shanghai Composite down 0.47% to end at 3,240 points, its second straight day of losses. And in contrast, the Shenzhen component rebounded from its Monday loss and was up 0.28%. Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index slid 1.54%, dragged by healthcare and technology stocks. In Australia, we see the S&P ASX 200 climbing 0.86% and closed at 7,300. 57 points, leading gains in the region and marking a seven-day winning streak. In Japan, the Nikkei 225 reversed earlier losses and ended the day marginally up at 33,388 points. South Korea's KOSPI also continued its slide from Monday, following zero, falling 0.18% and ended at 2,604 points.
Now, stock futures ticked lower early on Tuesday as investors looked ahead to a holiday-shortened week of trading. Futures tied to the Dow Jones Industrial Average fell 0.34%, while S&P 500 futures pulled back 0.33%. NASDAQ 100 futures declined 0.32%. Markets were closed for the regular trading session on Monday due to the Juneteenth holiday. Meanwhile, investors were seemingly receptive towards the central bank's decision to skip a June rate hike last week. The decision to skip a hike in June broke the Fed's streak of 10 consecutive interest rate increases. Now, after the break, more updates from the commodities market space. Do stay with us. This is Business Incorporated. Welcome back. Today on Commodities Space, we're going to be talking eggs in Nigeria. The price of a crate of eggs has settled at 2,300 naira since the start of the year, despite the naira cash scarcity, which triggered an egg glut, as well as rising food inflation, which is currently at 24.82%. Miriam Ode, analyst, financial derivatives company, joins us virtually with the latest update on that. Good afternoon, Miriam. It's good to have you. Uh, Miriam, uh, in April, poultry farmers sought FG's intervention uh, in the current egg glots being experienced in the market which had forced farmers to reduce prices. Bring us up to speed. What has been done so far and why are we still seeing elevated egg prices? Thank you, Will, for that question. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Mm. So, um, recently we have seen an um, uptick in egg prices from about 2,500 from 2,300 um, in January and in April. And so far, not much has been done to curb the to curb the egg rate um, problem in the in the country. But we saw um, 300,000 eggs in Lagos, Moktop, and 10,000 in Ogun State. But it is important to note that this was just a one-off event and not necessarily a solution to the egg rate problem, which is both situational and seasonal in the country. Situational in the sense that during the period that's in April. Consumers were still battling the Naira cash scarcity and shifting their demand towards um, necessary goods and cheaper alternatives. In this case, cheaper sources of protein, like the herring fish, popularly known as as shower that is sold for 500 Naira. Also, is um, the egg glute problem was also seasonal, as farmers in the poultry market usually experience higher levels of egg glute um, in the months of, from from February till May due to the higher temperature levels in the country that stimulates the hens to, um, to increase their egg production. So while on one hand, we were seeing um, supply for eggs increasing, supply of eggs increasing, we were also seeing the demand for eggs reducing. And this um, hindered farmers' ability to, to increase their prices and just settle at, um, at break even point. That was 2,300. But now we're seeing egg prices at about 2,500 due to the rising, um, rising animal feed costs made from grains such as um, corn, which is also experiencing a hike in its price due to the droughts in the US. So um, in the coming weeks, we expect egg prices to continue to uptick as the rainy season begins and the demand for um, hot tea and complementary goods such as bread, which um, eggs used to make increases. So we'll definitely, from what you said, continue seeing an uptrend in the prices of eggs, which is rather saddening for a lot of people do love their eggs. Now, looking at the alternative uh, possible solutions, you know, focus is on the spending. The federal government has had about $1 billion on importing powdered eggs yearly. Uh, is there an opportunity for farmers to integrate the production of, you know, to integrate into the production of egg powder in the country? Yes, there are several opportunities for farmers and even investors to um, um, increase their production of, of powdered eggs in the country. And the demand for these commodities, that's powdered eggs, is increasing both domestically and globally. We're seeing countries like um, Germany, Austria, the Netherlands, and South Korea increasing their demand for powdered eggs, which South Korea um, um, relaxing its restriction on imported egg products in order to meet up with its demand. And let's not forget that um, Nigeria is the largest producer of eggs in Africa. And 
and, and farmers in the domestic space are tending towards the use of um, the use of powdered eggs due to its longer life um, shelf span of or uh, shelf life of about six months when compared to whole or raw eggs, which ha only has a shelf life of six weeks. So we can see that there is still like a huge, um, a huge space for the industry to go to because um, to growth um, to because the um, only five less than five percent of total powdered eggs used in the country is um, locally produced, and this is why the government has to spend about one billion dollars on its importation. So we can see that there's a huge space for the industry to grow and investors can investors and farmers can take advantage of this by increasing their production of powdered eggs in the coming um, weeks. Now, if this is successful, Miriam, if we are successful in activating local production of powdered eggs, do you see this affecting demand and supply for eggs in general? It is likely that the increase in the production of powdered eggs would also increase um, both the demand and both the demand and supply of raw or whole eggs. This is because um, the raw eggs would have a derived demand mm -hmm. since um, raw eggs are dried in order to produce um, the powdered eggs. So with the increase in powdered eggs, we would see an increase in demand for eggs, which is used in the production of powdered eggs. And we we'll also see um, an increase in the supply of eggs in, um, as well, due to um, the need for supply to um, rise in order to meet up with rising demand. And we we'll see, um, we we'll see, um, uh, this will not be hard for like the country because, like I said before, Nigeria is the largest producer of of um, of eggs in Africa. And uh, this is due to our um, highly conducive weather environment when compared to other neighboring African countries. So we would see an increase in both the supply and the demand for whole eggs due to an increasing um, production of egg, of powdered eggs in the country. Thank you so much, Miriam Ode, for that update on the egg lot. We'll keep an eye out to see if prices how high the prices of eggs can get. Now, thank you so much, analysts, financial derivatives, for joining us on the program. Now, you, to other stories. In Egypt, the National Wages Council, NWC, has approved a 300 Egyptian pound increase in the monthly minimum wage for workers in the private sector to become 3,000 Egyptian pounds, up from 2,700, with effect from July the 1st. According to the NWC, the decision to raise the minimum wage for private sector workers again aligns with the council's objective to strike a balance between the interests of employees and employers. The council adds that the adjustment also takes into account the current economic conditions and high inflation rates. In April, the government adopted a social protection package worth 150 billion, which includes increases in salaries of public employees to help citizens with limited income deal with rising cost of living. Now the government of Zimbabwe has donated 4,400 metric tons of maize grain to United Nations World Food Program, WFP, to meet the food needs of refugees living at Tongogara refugee camp in Chimpenge. This was made known by the Ministry of Public Service, Labor and Social Welfare, and as the world celebrates World Refugee Day. According to the terms of the partnership, the WFP will cover the cost of transport, storage, handling, milling, and fortification of the maize, and the first batch of some 2,170 metric tons will be uplifted in the coming weeks. Now, the United Bank for Africa, UBA, and other African banks have signed an agreement with the African Continental Free Trade Agreement after to eliminate trade barriers. UBA signed a Memorandum of Understanding MOU with a portfolio of $6 billion at the ongoing African Bank Annual General Meeting in Accra, Ghana, targeting micro, small, and medium enterprises. According to UBA, the sectors to benefit from the unprecedented all-round support and trade facilitation are pharmaceuticals, automobiles, Mobile, transport and logistics, agriculture and agro-processing. That's a wrap on Business Incorporated for today. To join us tomorrow, same time for another edition. I'm Will Ibong. Bye for now.